So I think we are getting into very weird times because I think people are getting scared of what's going to happen. And uh, also, there are a lot of constraints from uh, universities and companies that constrain travel, but also attending large gatherings. And so uh, I know that the medical school people are kind of not allowed to, uh, to attend large gatherings, which makes them mind not 200 people like this. <laughs> anyway, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Justin. So Justin, as uh, you might, you will hear from his accent from, from the UK, from England, mm -hmm. and he was trained at Cambridge. And then he went to do his, 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 his PhD on transcription at ICRF and got his PhD there. And he claimed on his uh, CV that he is, has always been interested in transcription and the mechanism of transcription from uh, the beginning of his, uh, of his PhD. And then when he moved to the US for his postdoc, he continued to do that. And then he's studying a very specific set of transcription uh, factor which are involved in making the clock of the, the flies. And as you will see, the clock of uh, most of the species on Earth as well. So, um, Justin has been among us at, uh, um, at NYU since 2000. And I was came just a year after me. And I guess I was an old and he was a youngster. Yeah. And um, so we've been working together for 20 years now. And you and Chris were also there, and Carol and other people. And so we have been working together on the same floor for all the time. It has been quite a lot of fun. And again, I was really interested in transcription. You are interested in transcription, both of you. And therefore, we have basically form a, a, a structure there where we do care about how genes get uh, controlled and, and, and in different processes. In the case of Justin, how they can control on a daily cycle to be able to allow us to wake up in the morning before the alarm clock rings and to suffer when we go to Abu Dhabi after nine hours of jet lag and to be able to wake up in the middle of the night. Okay, so, um, so Justin is. Uh, is it's kind of his, his own personality. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, behind this kind of a British accent, that is some sort of a warmth, which is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's actually fairly transparent. So when Justin is happy, you can see. <laughs> when he gets irritated, you can also see. And I'm sure that, he, I mean, I'm pretty irritating most of the time. <laughs> so I can see often what he, what are you happy? And so I can see in his eyes what he's when he's irritated, but again, it's fine. He <laughs> goes back on his feet very quickly, and so do I. Anyway, so he has contributed quite extensively to the field, first as a postdoc to discovering a new loop that actually reinforced the initial loop of, of, of the clock, that allows the, 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 the timer to, to tick very, very regularly uh, every 24 hours. And then he moved to his own lab and continued that, and he showed quite a number of interesting features of the clock. And for example, it showed that the clock was controlled by activities. I think the flick activity was important for that early on when he was here. And then he published a very important paper. I think it showed that there is a lot of plasticity in the waves of neurons, both forming and retracting, forming and retracting, to be able to support this clock phenomenon. And again, it's kind of uh, special because in the slide field, showing plasticity is very, uh, very special because there is almost no plasticity there. But here, he showed a beautiful example of that. He's also somebody who went very early on into the, the genomics era, and uh, um, uh, basically, he, uh, also he was dealing with a very, very tiny number of neurons. He managed to get one of the first transcriptomes of those neurons to understand how those genes get regulated. And again, it's a beautiful system because as a neuron evolves for 24 hours, you can see how you can capture the transcriptome of those different neurons during this time. And so he's always kept a very small lab. But uh, I can see that, you know, as compared to his lab and my lab, the productivity per capita is like 10 times the one we have in my lab. So um, it's very, very good. And yet, it's direct as people with an iron fist. And uh, although it gives them a lot of freedom as well. And therefore, I mean, this allows them to be very productive and to get this original research that uh, we might not hear too much about because we need to hear more of the general features of how the clock functions in the world. So, Justin. Let's figure out you here. Thank you, Claude. I think you'll find with more science than Claude's introduction, or more of the hardcore science, than actually what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and let me start with a very. What are we doing? I think it's all right. The lights is fine. We'll keep everyone awake. Um, because that's my first question how did you wake up today? <laughs> right? Some of you. Right, would have been this alarm clock, or perhaps the, the modern version of the alarm clock. 
looking around and I'm not sure if anyone woke up to the uh, beautiful <laughs> sound of a young child. And a few of you may have woken up because your internal clock, Carol's nodding because Carol did, um, your internal clock tells you that it's time to wake up. And so this is what we've been studying, how animals know when to wake up. But we've been doing this in the fruit fly, which doesn't have external alarm clock. And so it has an internal system to, to tell it when to wake up and go to sleep. But what I want to do today is try and go from some really basic studies, how kind of we went from studying or we as a field. And so actually this is different from what I usually do. I'm not really going to talk about my own research at all. Uh, but how we went from the fly to understand human clocks. And, and so in particular, the brain of a fruit fly, but then it has impact in all kinds of things in humans. Whoops, that was the wrong button. Okay. Um, and I'm going to touch briefly on these topics that, you know, that I think that the people that were initially studying behavior of a fruit fly had no idea that the impact that their studies would have. And so in a way, what I'm doing is kind of talking about in praise of basic or open-ended research, and you pick something interesting to study and you don't know what's going to come from it. Um, but I think the findings are quite, quite amazing, quite interesting. And putting the slides together for this talk, I actually learned about some of the really interesting details of what people in my field are doing. All right, so we have to talk about circadian rhythms first of all. So we find them across life on Earth. And um, I'm going to show you this movie of a sunflower, which always surprises me how much plants move because we don't think of them as moving. But this is being tracked in someone's backyard in the Midwest. And you can see that it's moving. It's essentially tracking the sun as the sun moves through the sky. And then, as you watch, as the lights go down and they switch to infrared lights, you'll see that the plant really kind of droops, right? as if it's going to sleep. We I mean, wouldn't call this sleep in a plant. Um, but if you watch carefully, it's now getting ready for the day. And so it's actually getting ready. The leaves are coming up before the lights come on. And so this means that there's something driving that. It's not just responding to the light. And this is the plant's internal clock. And so all of these organisms have circadian rhythms. <laughs> well, that's my son from many, many years ago. <laughs> He's a bit bigger now. He's not usually in the audience. Um, and so these circadian or 24-hour rhythms, they, they maintain even in constant darkness. Um, they run at 24 hours at different temperatures, which is really important if you're not a warm-blooded organism, because the day is always 24 hours, whether it's uh, winter or summer. And they can get reset. As we know that happens in jet lag, we eventually adapt to a new time zone. And so what I want to do is start with how we studied this in fruit flies and why we studied it in fruit flies. And so that is obviously a good question, is uh, you know, why do head highly educated people study these <laughs> tiny little bugs? Right? It's a good question. And certainly myself, I can say this was not me. It might have been Claude. I have a feeling that Claude might have been one of these people running around catching butterflies, but it certainly wasn't me. I did have a stick. My only pet as a kid was a stick insect. So when I got as big as the jar, I gave it back to the person that gave it to me. I didn't like it at all. I was scared of it. Anyway, um, so it's not that we love insects necessarily, but they have a lot of really great advantages um, for biology. So I just want to introduce fruit flies in this way. So they're very small, right? So a, a, an adult fly is about an inch long. We keep them in these small vials so we can easily have 50 or 100 flies in a vial that costs uh, 25 cents. Um, a pair of flies can give several hundred offsprings. So we can get many, many flies from just uh, a couple of parents. And so they're cheap to, to, to keep in the lab um, and easy to keep in the lab. They are not hazardous, and no one seems to care if you squash a fruit <laughs> fly, right? And you compare this to, say, studying humans or monkeys or whatever. So there's very few. Uh, ethical worries. And then it turns out, so because of all these advantages, they're a common lab organism. And so we actually have this software stock center, which is like Amazon. You can just click on a few buttons and order stocks, and they arrive one or two uh, weeks later. Um, one of my PhD students used to call this Bloomingdale's, but it's actually Bloomington, <laughs> based at the uh, Indiana University. And they have, I think, currently somewhere upwards of 50,000 different mutant supplies we can just order at the click of a button. So this, this is clearly a very common organism used in labs. They have lots of genes, but they're much more compact than in the human genome. So in the early days when people were looking for genes, it was much easier to find the actual genes. 
And then many, there's a lot of similarities between human and fly genes. So about two thirds of human genes that cause disease have an equivalent gene in flies, which means we can do some basic studies of how these genes work in the fly and try and extrapolate to it for human treatment. And then finally, they have, they're, they're complex enough to show behaviors that are interesting, but they're also simple enough to study. And so that's uh, this particular behavior, that circadian clock, is what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. So how do we study fruit fly circadian rhythms? We actually have this completely automated. So we will take a fly, put it in a glass tube that's got some food at one end and a stopper at the other end. And um, then, then basically there's an infrared beam and a detector. And so we can measure when the fly is active because it breaks the beam. Um, and this is automated. We can put a fly away in a tube and, and come back two weeks later and look at the behavior of a single fly over those two weeks. And it'll look, or we put it in this, sorry, this all goes in a monitor. And the data ends up looking something like this. So the height of the black is the number of beam crossings that fly made in a five minute collection window. And so we can do this uh, for weeks on end. And what, in this, this experiment has two parts. So in the first part, the flies were in light dark cycles. In the second part, we turned out the lights completely and watched them in complete darkness. And so we actually double plot the data and you'll see why we do this in a minute when flies don't have normal rhythms. But basically on Monday, the fly was active and it became less active. And you can see that this pattern is retained in the light dark cycles. And then in complete darkness, you can see it's actually pretty similar. The flies are still active when the lights would have been on, even though they don't actually come on, and they're still inactive or in a sleep light state when the lights are off. So we know that this is being driven internally by the fly. They're in constant darkness, constant temperature, there's no external cues whatsoever, and they'll keep this going, this behavior going uh, for weeks as long as the food doesn't dry out. That's the, the bigger problem. And so, and this behavior is actually, so we call it circadian because it's about 24 hours. If you look at this, you'll see a slight leftward drift, uh, meaning that the fly is waking up fractionally earlier each day. And so the rhythm is circadian, meaning about 24 hours, not exactly 24 hours. So this is actually very accurate in complete darkness. The flies, um, uh, or mice actually have some of the best clocks, and they're accurate to within five minutes every day. Some individual mice literally one or two minutes change every day, which is, which is pretty good. Um, you can also see some rhythms in light dark cycles. So if you, what I've done is zoomed in on one of these days, and you can see that the fly actually anticipates when the lights are going to come on. It gets very active. <coughs> it's much less active. Sometimes even has a siesta in the afternoon, and then it gets active towards the lights going off, and it anticipates this transition. So just like that plant was raising its leaves before the lights um, go out, uh, come on, this fly is getting active before the light down transition. And one of the questions, of course, is, well, is this inactivity actually sleep? With this apparatus, you could imagine that the fly is just stuck at one end, having a feast nonstop. But it turns out that the fly actually, well, they didn't close their eyes. Or big eyes, but they droop their shoulders a little bit and they are actually inactive for many hours at a time. So we call this a sleep light state. And if you, like we do with humans, if you deprive flies of sleep overnight, they're much more likely to fall asleep earlier the next day. Just like uh, anyone that's pulled an all nighter writing a grant or whatever it is, um, well, not you, you're special, but anyway. Um, <laughs> There's a rebound effect. And then the question, of course, is how do these work? And so the geneticist's approach is try to deliberately break something that works beautifully and find out what you've broken. So the approach is to, and again, this goes back to the ethical concerns, we can mutate or break the DNA of flies deliberately. We don't look at them, we look at their offspring. And then we screen and see do they have any flies with non, with abnormal circadian rhythm. And if you look carefully, you'll see one. Should be easy. Can you see the mutant? The one with no, no, and you should be able to see it easily. I just copied and pasted lots of them. Um, <laughs> but this one up here has lost normal circadian rhythm. And in fact, these original uh, 
screens looking for flies with abnormal rhythms, ended up finding three different uh, mutants. So this is a normal fly. You can, you can draw pretty much a straight line down here, so its, it's internal clock is saying it's 24 hours. This is the fly that we just saw, so it's, it's got activity and rest bounds, but there's no organization to its behavior. And then there are these flies down here, which clearly have rhythms, they're just not 24-hour rhythms. And so if you measure the time from this fly waking up on this day, to the next day, to the next day, this one's clock is running at about 19 hours, and this one at about 29 hours. So is it in a dark? Or is it this is all in complete dark. That way we can really see what's, um, uh, what the internal clock is saying. They will be light dark circuit, they will be normal. They will be a little bit different. They'll be the light and the clock interact. I'll tell you about it tomorrow. <laughs> it's complicated. But when we, we want to just see what the genes are telling the fly to do, uh, we run these in complete darkness and we can get the readout of its internals. And so it turned out that all of these mutations were in the same gene, which was called period abbreviated to per. So we have this one, which is a, a completely broken the per gene, per null, and it's arrhythmic, and then we have per short and per long, which change uh, the fly's circadian period. And I'm going to summarize now 30 years of work without going deep into the biology uh, of how this per gene actually makes the fly's behavior be so rhythmic. So this is the gene per. It uh, gets activated and produces RNA. The RNA gets exported and turned into protein, and the per protein then ends up going into the nucleus and turning off more expression of the per gene. There are other factors that I won't go into in detail, but a couple of activators that are actually the targets of what per is inhibiting. And so actually what you have from a kind of engineering perspective is just a simple negative feedback loop. And the way that it works is to build in lots of delays. So you delay every step in the pathway, and that allows you to build up RNA before you end up shutting it off again. And so what that does is it gives us uh, rhythms that we can measure of the per RNA and the per protein, and we call this the molecular clock. And you go and read out, go and look at what happened in one of these arrhythmic flies, you find that this clock is completely broken, it's stuck at a constant state, and if you look at these flies with non-24 hour rhythms, this molecular clock is actually uh, running at the same time as their behavior. So that's why we think, that's why we know that this, whatever, that this clock is driving these rhythms and behavior. So this is all very kind of subcellular. What does this clock actually do inside a cell? Well, if we zoom in, this is a, we zoom in into the fly's head, we're now on top of the fly's head and we're going to zoom in. This is obviously not really colored like this. This is an artist's impression. Uh, what we find in the brain, and yes, fruit flies do have brains, is uh, lots of neurons that have these clocks. And what neurons do to communicate is they release signals to communicate to other neurons and transmit information. And so what this clock is actually doing in these neurons is determining when this neuron is going to send signals and when it's not going to get signals. So we can actually see daily rhythms in the firing of these neurons. And so the clock in a neuron drives neural, neuronal activity. And when we talk in, in a minute or two, we'll transfer to uh, some human studies and we'll see that these clocks in other tissues drive rhythms in, in other tissue activity. But I'll come to that in a second. So if we go back to this light dark behavior, this is as much as I'm going to talk about what my lab is doing. We actually have a set of clock of, of neurons. Um, that are called the morning clock neurons that drive the morning peak of activity, and another set which have clocks which are firing in the evening to drive that evening peak of activity. And we're interested in all the processes and how this works, but I'm not going to talk about that at all today. You have to come to a totally different talk for that. Because what I want to do is make the jump now from how studying the brain of a fruit fly actually impacts human, uh, human stuff. Let's leave it at that. Um, and the first, the first question that existed for a very long time is whether humans had per genes. We know we have body clocks, we know when we get jet lag, um, we're aware of our clocks, uh, but did it work the same way? Are we just big flies? And people looked for many, many years to try and find the per gene. And it wasn't until the human genome was sequenced that it turned out that actually we have three genes which are with a very similar sequence uh, to the fruit fly per gene. 
and imaginatively they're called human per one, human per two, and human per three. And so, of course, we want to know, scientists want to know, are the human per genes important for human behavior? So I told you how we did this in the fruit flies. We mutate uh, fruit flies. You'd be pleased to know we don't do that in humans. Um, but we can still learn about the function of, of genes from studying uh, the abnormal. And in this case, the abnormal are people with something called familial advanced sweet face syndrome. And what that means is it runs in the family, that's the familial, and they wake up much earlier than usual. So the, you'll see a record in a minute of a woman, and she typically will go to sleep at 7.30 and wake up at 4.30 the next day. That's her typical rhythm, so she's advanced sweet phase to her husband and then most of the rest of the world. And when she went into a, an isolation clinic, so she lived in a dimly lit apartment for two weeks with no cell phone, no nothing. She was retired, maybe that explains it. But she, um, you can see that there's a, the timing of sleep, in this case it's sleep, not activity, is, is, is going earlier and earlier every day. And if you, if you uh, quantify this, her clock is running at about 23 hours, whereas probably most of the people in this room would be running at 24.1 hours. Uh, and this runs in a family. So this, she's one of the individuals in this large family. And it turned out that she had a mutation in her human per 2 gene. And so it's just one tiny little change, one amino acid, uh, and one copy of the gene that gave her the 23-hour rhythm. So that's advanced sleep phase syndrome. So you can go from a fruit fly to understanding these basic, uh, some sleep disorders in humans. There's also delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is the opposite of advanced sleep phase. So in this record, again, we're looking at sleep. This uh, is a more detailed analysis of exactly the different phases of sleep. But it basically, if you compare when people are going, when kind of normal people or people with DSPS are going to sleep, you can see again, we've got this quite strongly delayed sleep phase syndrome. And uh, these people's clocks are running slightly long, closer to 25 hours, and that's what's uh, giving this delayed sleep phase. Now, some of you might say, well, I might, I would say, but that's just like all the teenagers I have in my house, <laughs> and they all have delayed sleep phase syndrome. And it actually, it turns out there's a lot of variability in the human population. So, uh, this is a plot of chronotype, and the numbers correspond quite closely, but not exactly, to your mid-sleep phase. So if you sleep from midnight till 8 a.m., your chronotype's going to be about 4. That, that's, it's close to that. There's some changes for weekend activity, but you can see this very kind of broad distribution of when people uh, typically have their mid-sleep phase. So the delayed sleep phase syndrome people would be over here, and the advanced sleep phase syndrome be over here. And this not only does it change in the population, it changes with age. So this is actually looking at, now we've got chronotype on this axis and age across here, and you can see that chronotype gets later and later until the end of adolescence. And it's even stronger in boys than in girls. So in males, the, the chronotype, and it takes a little bit longer to switch back towards the rest of the population and it's also even more exaggerated. So that's what I go through regularly at weekends. Um, so this is a big deal, right? So we have, we, can, we have delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is happening in children, in teenagers, and also in a few kind of extreme variants. Um, so question for you, what is the most important activity for teenagers, at least according to their parents? Teenagers don't know. School, right, exactly. So you imagine, right, so this is typically, so for, if this was a record for most of us, we'd be waking up uh, and then going, going, to, going to work or whatever activities we do a few hours later. If you put that same time frame on these uh, teenagers, they would ideally still be asleep. And yet we have, a, you know, we have school start time quite early. Often my kids leave before I do to go to school. So there's a study, yes? What is the importance of REM in this particular aspect? Uh, there is, in this particular, it doesn't matter. This is just a, a way of measuring what, when sleep is. This was the best example I could find. Um, we can talk about sleep phases later, it's fine. Um, all right, so these teenagers, this, so sending teenagers to school, when they would ideally be uh, 
uh, asleep is not ideal. And so there was a study that wanted to address what would happen to their uh, productivity or their, how well they did at school if we shifted the school start time. So you probably remember this movie, Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> this was, the study was done in Seattle, but it was called Sleep More in Seattle. <laughs> and so what they did was they convinced a, a large high school district to start school almost an hour later in the spring of 2017 than in the spring of 2016. And then asked, what does that do? And the first thing they measured was whether these kids go to sleep. And so you might expect that actually just, you know, if you knew school was starting later, you just go to uh, go to bed later, but actually the kids go to bed a little bit later, but not much. But what you can see in the, with the later school start is they do sleep almost an hour more than they were doing the previous year. So obviously these are different kids because they looked at the same, uh, same grade, but if you do average over a population, uh, you can see that this, this, uh, the later school start time is getting more sleep. So how does that affect how they do in school? Well, their grades went up, so by about 5%, um, the, the overall GPA was the latest start time. And at least in this high school district, you can see the absences went down and the proportion of uh, kids that were turning up late for school also went down. So this is one high school. In this other high school, there's no, ch no change. So what do you think is the difference between these two schools? While I take a slow of water. Silence. You're out to guess. Did the other school just party start late? No, so both both of these schools were starting at 7.50. Have I got the colors wrong? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, both of the schools were starting at 7.50 and then eight, one year and 8.45 the next year. Sorry about the colors. Um, it wasn't a latitude, it was actually a socioeconomic difference. Yeah. So this was a much more affluent a school in a much more affluent district. So presumably they were getting a little more support to get to school on time. So if you're looking for kind of simple ways to um, equalize, you know, get, override some of the inequality, starting school at a later time actually helps uh, kids from poorer areas. They get more sleep uh, in their schools. They're in this group. They're in this group. So I think. Uh, so they did. I mean, again, it's not the same kids year to year, but it's on average, yes. I mean, this was a decent amount of big change. Yes? Uh, these are, I assume, were public schools. I'm wondering if you had a private school where the children slept in at the school. Uh, have there ever been any studies looking at that? It's a different kind of control? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, that would be an interesting experiment, um, but a much smaller sample size. <laughs> One of the, I mean, this is actually a big study. There were, thousands of kids in this so it has a bit more statistical power because the changes are not huge but they are but they're def there are definite changes and that, that would be a nice experiment but you'd have to convince it's probably easier to mandate this also in a, in a public system. yeah all right so we've gone from fruit flies to human sleep disorders with a little bit of public policy thrown in for good luck and we're going to go to a clock resetting next so this is an experiment from mice. So we're looking at one of these mouse clock genes, the mpur one gene. And it shows a rhythm, like the fly per gene. So it's high uh, in the light or in the subjective light. It's actually still dark. It shows this molecular clock. Now what happens when you give uh, mice light is you get a rapid increase in the RNA levels of, of, the levels of this mpur one gene. And then it keeps ticking but the clock has actually shifted, so the peak is now happening several hours later. So light at night, when the mice are not expecting the clock, shifts the clock. What about us? When do we normally see light? Probably it's gonna happen, the same thing's gonna happen. So in this experiment, we're looking at when we see light. They uh, took college students, one of the best studied group of people in the world, uh, <laughs> and they took them for a week camping, so they're in natural light, or they took them for a week when they were still on campus, and electrical lights. And so there's a couple of things you can see here. First of all, natural light is a lot brighter than electrical light. This is a log scale, so it's uh, um, many times a day, tenfold brighter uh, out in the light. And then you'll see this tail here. So this is light, electrical light that we're getting in the evening. And when you look at the phase of people, when you look at when they were sleeping, 
So the, the students under natural light, you can see they're actually stopping sleeping right around sunrise where the college student, the students back on campus, the same people, are sleeping much later. So, so this light that we see in the evening is, is shifting our clock. And the question, of course, is, well, what light is most effective at shifting our clocks? It turns out that it's blue light. And when do we see blue lights? Actually at dawn, that's the good news. Dawn tends to be more full of blue lights. Any other blue light that we see? Cell phones. Cell phones, computer screens. Uh, so that's, so that, these are big effects on this. These screens are quite blue and they have a lot of effects on resetting our clock. So what can we do to try and resynchronize our clock to the natural day? Uh, the general rule is light by day, darkness at night, which means good to get outside, to so get that natural boost of sunlight. And then at night, you can wear these uh, blue filtering glasses, um, or you can use this thing that many iPhones now have on them, this efflux program that will actually filter out some of the blue lights. So we'll see what happens as they reduce the blue light, you get a kind of pinkish glow to the screen, but you can still work on your computer, you're just reducing essentially the blue wavelengths and boosting the red a bit. And that will reduce the effect of, uh, of working on a computer screen at night. And the good thing is that uh, actually now we have three different kinds of LEDs, so architects are getting really interested in the idea that you could uh, maybe change these lights to stop me getting, <laughs> resetting my clock, but you can have more, more or less blue lights coming out in the evening. So there's actually a, what is this, the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture where they're trying to integrate some of these basic uh, understanding of, of science into architectural design. And here's another example from a hospital. So they've actually, rather than just having lights all the time, they filtered these, uh, um, they put in these special lights up here that are changing the, the amount of blue, the light intensity and the amount of blue. And so you, as you start to get into the evening, you can make the lights darker and darker and see so you're resetting the clocks of the patients much less. One of the kind of byproducts that happened with this was that actually people were quieter in the hallways. If you've ever spent any time in a hospital, you're continually woken up by lights, by loud noises. So this had this kind of interesting uh, side product. Yes? Boris, when you say reset, do you mean uh, distorting the natural circadian? Is that what I mean, about? yeah, I mean shifting it. Shifting, okay. Yeah, so that you end up, it's then harder to get up the next day. A new setting, a new setting, you're putting a new setting. Exactly, absolutely. All right, this is going to go forever, I think. Okay, so, so one of the questions that people were interested in is where are these clock genes found in mammals? And it turns out that they're not only in the brain driving our behavior, but in many, many of our tissues. And this, um, so we actually have circadian clocks in most of our tissues. And so this then has uh, big effects on all kinds of physiology. When we shift time zones, we, uh, we get a new time zone cue, but it takes a while for that information to go to the clocks in our body that don't see light. And so it takes a while for us to uh, get over this horrible thing called jet lag. So what can we do? First of all, you can start to adapt before you shift time zones. Obviously now with the virus everywhere, no one's traveling, but anyway, in theory, in the future, uh, you can adapt before you go. And then you can also have what we call a light shower, not I mean, you can have a shower, but you can have a light shower. In the morning, you want morning light when you arrive in a new time zone. And there's actually an app uh, called Entrain that you will help tell you how to start to adapt before you go, when to avoid light, um, and what time is the most effective time to see light in a new time zone. But generally, it's going to be morning light. The other thing you can do is to eat at the new time zone time. And the reason for that is that uh, in addition to light being a cue for your brain clock, feeding will be a cue for your liver and your digestive tract and some of your internal tissues. And so you can start to kind of resynchronize your clock in both directions. Yes? The arrows here are from the brain to the organ, particularly the digestive tract. Is there any evidence that those arrows can go the other way as well? Yeah. There's a little bit of evidence, but this is the do light is the dominating cue. Um, there is a little bit of evidence, but but it, it's yeah. So there probably should be some weak arrows going back the other way. But exactly how that works, I don't think we know. Yes. Uh, I think it's 
Yes. If I may just ask, in the last one you showed the Oris in the, in the hospital, you talked about it from the perspective of the patient. But what about the staff? Right. When the light went down, mm -hmm. How did that affect staff behavior? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. I took that video from a, a company website. Okay. Um, what I would like to think is obviously the well-being of the patients is above <laughs> the welfare <laughs> of the staff. It's the alertness factor. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, um, so whether they still have some, they presumably have some rooms that they can control and they can, um, they can go and turn on, the, if they need to do something in the room, with a patient, they can turn the lights on. They can override that general thing. Um, yeah, no, that's a really good question, because obviously that, those, are, those facts are in as well. All right, so food can reset our clock, and actually our circadian clocks, as I told you, need to be reset a little bit every day, because they're not exactly 24 hours. And that light comes in to that, and so there is a question, which obviously is quite relevant, with daylight savings coming uh, right now, is that the daylight savings time is actually a good idea. And in general, the, the circadian community says no. There are two, pro two main problems with daylight savings. First of all, you get that very brief sleep deprivation, certainly in the spring, what is it, spring forward, right? And, and that, has, that has profound effects. So actually, this is a study that showed that Heart attacks go up by about 24%. Doesn't mean 24% of people are going to get a heart attack. It <laughs> goes up a bit uh, when we, when the clocks spring forward. They look look at how many heart attacks they, they had uh, in the hospital. This was on a Monday. This was a study across a lot of Michigan hospitals. Actually, it goes down when people get a bit more sleep in in the fall back time. And then there's obviously effects on uh, the immune system. Sleep is, is crucial for immune function. Um, so if you were a brave public policy maker, you would just cancel daylight savings if there might be a pandemic. But anyway, that's um, moving on. The other thing that's really, really tough with, with daylight savings is the kind of misalignment of sun time and social time. So for people like us, thank goodness, we live on the east of the uh, eastern time zone, in standard time, our sun time, the, the kind of middle of the day, is right when our, our clocks say the middle of the day. But daylight savings actually misaligns that. But for people living on the western edge of uh, the eastern time zone, they're already misaligned in standard time, and it gets even worse in daylight savings time. So there's a question right now in policy, what, you know, should we, should we keep changing clocks, or should we shift it? constant daylight savings time, because a lot of people like that, the light in the evening. But it turns out that actually having our clocks, uh, our social and our sun clocks aligned, that's best for all kinds of things, for sleep, for health, and that has effects on lifespan and GDP and productivity and, and all these things. So the, the society that I'm a member of, the, the research on biological rhythms, is strongly pushing for constant standard time as opposed to constant daylight savings. So again, all of this comes starts with a humble little fruit fly. Now we've uh, tackled a little bit of jet lag, lighting design, and even public, even public policy. But what I want to talk about is now the effect of the clocks in some of these other tissues, and this is starting to become more and more appreciated and has quite uh, big effects. So there are clocks in the immune cells, and the immune system weakens with age. So this is a study, this next study I'm going to talk about was done in, in people 65 and over in the UK, and they were given a flu vaccine. So they, were, they measured the anti-influenza antibodies before they were given a vaccine. They were then vaccinated either in the morning or the afternoon, and 30 days later they measured the level of response to that vaccine, the amount of antibodies produced by that vaccination. And there's quite a big change whether you were vaccinated in the morning or the afternoon. These people were, had very similar levels beforehand. Uh, so if you want a simple way to make uh, at least flu vaccinations um, more effective, go and get your flu vaccination in the morning. It doesn't mean that you could say, okay, well, this, the doctors are better in the morning at giving a you know, flu vaccination. I'll show you something that shows the opposite. So this is uh, the clocks in the heart, and this has an effect on your recovery uh, from heart surgery. So this was done in France, 
And they wanted to know whether the time of day made a difference on the outcome of uh, cardiac surgery. And so what they did was they measured some people who were given surgery in the afternoon or the morning. They followed them over about a year and a half. And they're looking at the kind of cumulative uh, heart problems that they had. And so you can see that the people who had surgery in the afternoon had a much lower chance of getting uh, some major heart event uh, in the following year and a half. And if they just looked at acute heart failure, again, you can see the difference. That having a heart surgery in the afternoon is about two to two and a half times more effective than having it in the morning. Now, so this says it's not just the alertness of the surgeons, because you would imagine them to be more alert in the morning. But this, we think, is due to the heart being better able to repair itself in the afternoon. And this is kind of opening up this whole kind of concept of circadian medicine. If all of our tissues are doing different things at different times of day, that just taking a pill, taking a pill might, you might be able to give a much lower dose or much might have more effective um, outcome if you take it at a defined time of day. And this is something that's clearly complicated. Clinical trials will get much, uh, much harder. It's hard to make sure, it's hard enough for people to take their medicine let alone take it at a tough, defined time of day. But I think this, this, this is uh, just kind of the beginning of trying to integrate our understanding of the circadian clock with medicine to make it more effective and have less heart attacks and other things. So we've got beginning in the slide all the way to circadian medicine. The last thing I want to talk about is food, which apparently we might have afterwards. There might be a reception downstairs. Um, so. This is an experiment that was done in mice, and you'll see why it was done in mice in a second. Uh, mice were given either a normal diet or a high-fat diet, and they were allowed in this first part of it just to, they had the food in the, in the crate all through. So anytime they wanted to eat, they could eat. And perhaps not surprisingly, the mice on the high-fat diet gained a lot more weight over the 20 weeks of the experiment than the mice on the normal diet. And this is very high fat. This is 60%. This is like eating nachos and cheese and ice cream, which maybe a few other people in this room would love, but in general, that's not a balanced diet. Um, so these mice gain a lot of weight. But then they wonder what happens if we just restrict when the mice get the food. So with the normal diet, these mice doesn't seem to make much difference. What about the high fat diet? So again, they're just giving uh, food to the mice during the dark phase, and just, just to be clear, obviously mice are nocturnal, so this is when mice are awake, so this is their equivalent of the day. So you can see here, this is actually a plot of when the mice are eating. So not surprisingly, they're eating, uh, this is the, the, the dark red line, they're not eating when there's no food, and they're eating in this burst of uh, eight hours of feeding, whereas the other mice, on the uh, when the food was there, would seem to be kind of snacking all throughout the 24 hours on average. The mice take in the same amount of calories. Whatever they do, they eat almost exactly the same amount of food. When you look at their weight, it was quite a surprise. These mice don't actually gain weight. And it's pretty obvious when you look at the mice, uh, yeah, poor mice. So this is why we do this experiment in mice. So that's actually kind of uh, mind-blowing in a way, right? Because we go to the grocery store and there are calories on everything. We go to the, the um, restaurant will tell you how much you can eat, how much calories, but this experiment says it actually doesn't matter what you eat, it's when you eat that's really important. And so um, it's not just weight either. So here, so they looked at the kind of the body composition, and of course there's a lot more fat in the fat mice. Um, the liver weight goes up, their cholesterol levels are much higher. Maybe that's not surprising, it's the fact that none of these change from the, from the mice on the normal diet in the mice that were given the high-fat diet with a time-restricted component. So they actually wanted to know whether eight hours was the magic number, right? So eight hours was initially chosen because that's when people were in the lab. They come in at nine, they give the mice the food, they go and <laughs> take them off the food at five, and so that makes it easy to do. But they wanted to know, was it something special about eight hours? So they started looking at several other times. So they looked at nine hours of time-restricted feeding, 12 hours of time-restricted feeding. So again, this is on the high-fat diet. And both of those seem to be fine compared to the mice that gain a lot of weight when they can feed all around the clock. And actually, this purple one 
There's mice that were on a kind of weekend, weekday schedule. So they had five days of nine hour feeding, and then two days they could do anything they want at the weekend. And this also seems to be pretty good in terms of keeping the weight off. Is that nine hours not eating? Nine hours of eating. So the food's in the cage for nine hours on, on Monday to Friday. I guess it makes it easy to set the experiment. So Saturday and Sunday they can eat whenever they want. And that still seems to work in, keep, in terms of keeping, keeping weight off. Um, Were those adults? These were, I think so, yes. Not juveniles. It's a good question. I don't know that it's a sort of, uh, I think they were adults, but I'm not 100% sure. When you start kind of breaking through the 12 hours, so when you go into uh, 15 hours on the high fat diet, some of the, the benefits of restricting a feeding don't seem to work. So there seems to be some crucial kind of time between 12 and 15 where you need to restrict your eating uh, and then weight, then the, the weight of the mice doesn't uh, increase. So basically, if mice eat fat at the wrong time of day, the liver metabolizes um, fat less well during sleep time, so they gain weight. And also, losing the time feeding cue actually boosts the clock in the liver. Um, so the mice that are eating fat all the time have a weaker liver circadian clock, so that also contributes to the worse metabolism. So, that's uh, what about Fruit flies, of course. We've got to go back to fruit flies. Don't forget fruit flies. So fruit flies, this experiment was looking at time-restricted feeding on sleep. So this is, a, instead of activity before, this is sleep. So flies have a siesta, and they have lots of sleep at night. You put flies on a high-fat diet. By week five, they're, they're sleeping at very low levels. You give them time-restricted, high-fat diet. They're still sleeping a lot during the night. And actually, uh, their hearts also function better in old flies when feeding time is restricted. So we see it in mice, we see some benefits in, in flies. What about humans? So when, we need to know when, when we sleep and when we eat. And probably if I ask you, you say, well, I probably eat for about 12 hours a day, right? Kind of, maybe, maybe not. But people actually wanted to measure this, so they gave them the equivalent of a Fitbit, and they asked them to take uh, photos of everything that they ate, and you can make a kind of feeding and, and activity plot uh, of every meal that people uh, people have, and you can see when they're active and when they're inactive and when the meal comes. And so this is one record from one person. But when you look at the kind of range of human activity, so here we're looking when they were taking in calories. And so there's not many people that restrict it to 12 hours. There are some people who almost seems like yeah, I know. Like the, one of my friends who did the research said, it looks like some people, as soon as they're awake, their mouths are open and they're eating. And if you look at in terms of what calories are going in, many, many people are taking in. Uh, sorry, about 50, it looks like about fifty percent of the population is eating for fifteen or more hours a day. And it's not just the fact that they're eating; it's what they're eating. So, with the data of, of the actual meals, you can ask. What are people eating and when? And so, water, no caloric content, okay? And so you can see water being uh, drunk around the day. Perhaps not surprisingly, coffee's got a peak in the morning, and then people drink less and less coffee. You can see uh, when people are eating salad, not surprising, this is not a you know, typical snack to most people, so they're eating uh, salad kind of at lunch and dinner, same with pasta, lunch and dinner. When you look at what's going on at the end of the day, it's things with high calorific content. So ice cream, alcohol, with two of the two of the things. So we're eating, so it's not just that we're eating for extended periods of time, we're also putting on a lot of calories late at night. So the question was, well, if we if we if uh, people could restrict when they're eating, what would happen to their weight? Right? We've done this in mice, fruit flies, does it have a benefit for humans? And so uh, this is time-restricted eating in what are called healthy, overweight humans. Not something I totally understand that term, but anyway. It's, um, and so what they did was to measure the baseline of uh, baseline of when people are eating and feeding. And then people, the volunteers, were allowed to choose a 10 or a 12-hour window. You could choose when that was. of when, and, and you would be allowed to eat in that 10 or 12 hours, and they were monitored for that 16 weeks. And then they were followed up 
36, hour, 36 weeks later, but they hadn't been monitored at all that time. And what they found was that people rapidly lost weight. So each individual spot is an individual person. So it's a small study, um, but people, not only did they lose weight in general, but that weight stayed off a year later. So this seemed to be a fairly easy way to lose weight and keep it off. And they also felt more energetic in the morning, more energetic overall um, than they did when they started the baseline time. So this is a very kind of, you know, you could eat anything on this diet, you just have to restrict when you eat it. In terms of simple diet, it doesn't get much simpler. Question? When you were discussing the, the liver and this issue of uh, changing its metabolism, um, metabolizing uh, the proteins, uh, a question occurred to me about the question of diabe uh, diabetes. Now, it's not just something that human beings have. I assume it's in mammalians. Is it in non-mammalians? <laughs> it's a tough question. Let, let me tell you, the question is whether other species apart from even humans have diabetes. You could, there are mouse models of diabetes, um, but in general, I don't know that anything else on this planet has diabetes. But I'm out of my depth in bucks, but I'm going to turn your question around and say, well, what about uh, time-restricted eating for people with metabolic syndrome? And that's a broad, right, so that's what you want to know about. Metabolic syndrome, um, a cluster of conditions uh, that occur together, which uh, includes things like high blood pressure, sorry, high blood sugar, increased blood pressure, excess body fat. And so what they did with this group of people who are on medication for metabolic syndrome is change them from eating, and most of them eating for more than 14 hours, and then go back down to 10 hours. So again, there's time-restricted eating. They didn't change the medication, they didn't change anything else. And they asked what happened to their weight, and there's a small decrease in weight, this is only, again, only 14 weeks. There's uh, quite a decent change in their waist circumference. There's a big change in blood pressure, and again, these are all going in the right way. And there's a big, uh, there's a good decrease in the, um, the bad form of cholesterol. So, again, this is an incredibly simple intervention and something that could have profound implications uh, for humanity. So, yes? Is the shifting of time, is there a difference between, say, 6 o'clock in the morning to 8 at 10 hours later, which would be whenever? and starting at noon to right. 9 o'clock at night. I don't know that enough studies have been done. And if you go all the way back to the kind of variation in chronotype, right, variation of our own internal clocks a little bit, you would have to really carefully control for that. In general, what people say is if you could just restrict eating to 10 hours, 8 hours, that window it probably doesn't matter as long as it's not too close to bedtime when, when you're, you're not going to digest so well. So in general, those, and again, these are early days in this kind of study. We don't totally understand the mechanisms, and there will be individual variations as well. So when do you eat? So I, don't, <laughs> I, I generally keep to about 12 hours. Uh, I don't follow it. I, what when I, from, sorry? When, from when, when, when do you start from the finish? Roughly 7 to 7. 7.30 to 7.30. I, I, don't, I don't keep to it routinely. I don't keep to it sorry, rigidly, but that's roughly. Yes? Um, uh, uh, the effect of a restricted uh, uh, eating on uh, liver weight, meaning probably is the, the liver losing the fatty stuff, right? Yes, but yes. What is, the, what is the effect? What is the effect? The effect is, right, you have much less fatty liver. So if you restrict, so you can eat, so the mice, again, this is in mice, where you can really put them on this extreme diet. Um, yes, when they eat a high fat diet, but for a time restricted, they do not get a very fatty liver. They reverse the liver fat? So, so they were never put on it, they never put it on in the first place. So I, the, the, can you reverse it is another experiment. I don't know if that's been done, probably. And my guess would be yes, but I don't know. And I'm trying to remember the papers. The, the back? In Spanish culture, uh, for a variety of reasons, 
uh, they often find that the, even children eat extremely late at night. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if any of these studies have looked at a culture where they had that kind of shift. Yeah, they also sleep during the day, so that's... Well, yeah. sometimes, yes, but not every day. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. In prepping for this talk, I learned a lot, but I didn't... I don't know about that one. And the, the challenge, of course, um, you know, from an experimental point of view is, am I going to go in and totally disrupt the culture? What well, do you control uh, for? Yeah. Right. yeah. No, so right. So you could look at similar... Um, well, I know studying flies and mice is so much easier because you can control everything, right? You don't need a life. You say, okay, this, you're going to eat ice cream and nachos all day, or you're going to eat the regular chow. Um, yes? But drinking also is included, like even except water, right? So water is fine. Water, water that's no fine. Calories. Yeah, so it's... There's no calories, no sugar. Right, so, so, so when they were measuring, right, so they snapped, you know, people snapped everything that they ate. Yeah. And then obviously, then they filter the data and look for caloric intake or yeah, non-caloric intake. Yeah. So uh, I'll take more questions. Then just this is that was pretty much the end. I just wanted to show you the kind of journey all the way from the humble fruit fly and these researchers that started out looking for flies uh, that didn't have normal 24 hours, um, and how the basic studies in flies have shed light on human sleep disorders that potentially um, could change how we design the lighting. Uh, in buildings, public policy, there's a lot of implications for circadian medicine, and finally, uh, some implications for obesity and wellness. And the acknowledgements are just some of the greats in this field. So, uh, Ron Canop, who was just a PhD student when he isolated those first clock mutants that studied, that started everything. Um, I did my postdoc with Mike Young, who got me excited about this field in general, and then I've talked about experiments from many, many people in the circadian rhythm people, but in particular, my friend Sachin Panda, who's done work on time-restricted uh, feeding, first of all in mice, and then time starting to translate that into human studies. So I'll stop there and take any more questions if there are any.